there was a simultaneous declassification of material about the UK-USA treaties, the original treaties between the UK and the United States governing cooperation between GCHQ and the National Security Agency. And there's a nice story about how this all began, which you can get at by looking at uh, some of the documents interestingly released by the NSA and not by GCHQ. And it all began when Alan Turing arrived in the United States in 1942 on a mission to inspect what was happening with the US Navy mass building of bombs to do the Enigma decryption for the uh, North Atlantic submarine war. And Alan Turing, bless his heart, basically arrived without any formal documentation from the British government and was detained on Ellis Island and interrogated. And uh, he, you know, there's some lovely correspondence that you can find when you know, essentially the American attitude was, who is this rather eccentric limey? What do we do with him? So what was supposed to be a two-week trip, then through a catalogue of sort of mistakes and happenstance, uh, turned into a three-month trip while he tried to fight the US Army bureaucracy to get access to the things that he was supposed to go and visit. And then in the, in the US sort of military literature, what then became known as the Turing Affair, turned into a need to develop more formal treaties for intelligence cooperation. But when you look back through some of those original drafts and then the evolution up to, I think, the 50s of the UK-USA treaties, it's clear that there was always much more tension in the so-called special relationship than has been evident in the way that politicians talk about it today. And although there were defined areas of cooperation and protocols to avoid conflict in those cooperation, there has never been any doctrine that you will not do political spying on the internal affairs of even of an ally. Now, it seems that, that what we've learned in the last 48 hours, that PRISM is, is a code word for a particular program. The ways in which these sorts of programs are uh, referred to, Echelon, of course, is, is a notorious example. Echelon was not, as it were, the whole enchilada. Echelon was a particular system that then became a sort of cynic doc for the entire global intelligence structure, but in fact it was one particular program, and Duncan referred to that this morning. Um, another code word you may see associated with the prison material is ORCON, which stands for originator controlled. In other words, the originating government, in this case the US government, uh, has a veto on any sort of downstream use of that. However, that is repackaged and source sanitized and distributed. Uh, and what struck me looking at uh, both the Verizon material and the PRISM material is the code word no foreign, no foreign eyes. And that is to say that nobody who's not a US national should be able to see that material. So one thing this talk is not about is the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act is extremely complicated. It's more than 100 pages. It has about 12 different sort of modalities of surveillance contained in it. It amends the original FISA 1978 law and other statutes. Uh, and in fact, it is a part of the Patriot Act, Section 215, which was sold to Congress as to do with accessing library records. Uh, that was the power on which the Verizon uh, order was based. And you remember, three days, the Verizon order was essentially scooping up the metadata, the, the traffic data, the stuff we're thinking about in the communications data bill, about all internal US telephone calls from Verizon, as well as international calls. So this talk is not about that. What this talk is also not about is cloud as data storage, just like SkyDrive or some place to stuff your photos. And the reason this talk is not about that is, well, you can, if you're just using the cloud as storage, you can encrypt the data yourself. Of course, many systems like Dropbox don't do that. They actually do the encryption their end for you, which means they have the key. But in principle, if you're just using the cloud for data storage, you can encrypt it. What this talk is about is the use of data centers for massive parallel processing. And I think we have a fairly technical audience here, so it's going to be pretty obvious that the CPU in the data centers can only crunch on the data if it's in plain text, if it's being decrypted. Now, on the right-hand side of the photograph, you'll see 
uh, a room which has the number on it 641A. Does anyone know what that means in this context? Is that familiar? Okay. Um, so you could summarize this talk sort of symbolically by saying, is there in fact in some of the major US data centers a room like that in some of the modern data centers on the left? But they're two photographs stuffed together. So the first thing we need to think about is in all of this US law, going back to the original 1978 FISA law, which was, if you like, the fallout of Watergate and the Frank Church congressional investigation of the activities of the NSA and the CIA spying on American people. What came out of that was this 1978 FISA law, and that created this very sharp separation in American law of treating US citizens and legal residents differently from everybody else, from foreigners. And it defined this term foreign intelligence information. And foreign intelligence information sounds like it should be to do with money laundering and terrorism and serious crime. And indeed, in the limbs of the complicated definition, all those things are there. But what isn't really talked about much, and what I want to emphasize today, is these things which are highlighted. And when you unwind a couple of these levels of definition, that's what you get. So foreign intelligence information can mean, includes, information with respect to a foreign-based political organization or foreign territory that relates to the conduct of the foreign affairs of the United States. That's plenty broad. <laughs> and if you compare that with the equivalent definitions in all the European laws, including UK laws that I'm familiar with, this is way broader. I mean, this is way broader than national security, as it's normally understood. And indeed, this foreign-based political organization, there is clarifying rubric that means this doesn't have to be a political party. This can be a political activist or anybody active in the political affairs of this foreign country. But again, this foreign territory um, relates, uh, it, it is very broad indeed. So, in fact, there's a discrimination factor here because if you were a U.S. citizen, that <coughs> relates would be necessary. Much, 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 much stiffer criteria. But if you're a foreigner, it's just <coughs> relates. So throughout the talk, I want you to bear in mind the breadth of that definition. So the context of this talk in the previous decade is, is the war of the wiretapping affair. And to summarize the history very briefly, in 2003, uh, a technician for AT&T in the San Francisco switching center called Mark Klein discovered that that secret room, 641A, was being built in his switching center by people with rather scary badges from the NSA. And after a little bit of digging <coughs> around, he discovered what they were doing was installing a top-of-the-range DPI box, deep packet inspection box, feeding in one of the main fiber optic cables on the western seaboard of the United States, carrying, obviously, domestic traffic as well as international traffic, and splitting it. And the NARA 6400 box was triaging this data in real time and presumably filtering and sending some part of that off direct to the NSA for processing. Now, he tried to go to the, to the newspapers about this, and the New York Times finally broke the story in 2005. But in fact, they'd sat on the story for a year uh, until the 2004 election was out of the way. And several other whistleblowers have come forward uh, from the NSA and the FBI, and all of them really tried official channels first, and then the media, and they've been ignored and, and prosecuted. Um, so this, this scandal, for raging for a couple of years, was then legalized by a thing called the Protect America Act, which was an interim act. It was very controversial, and one of the things it did is gave retroactive immunity to the telecommunication companies who allegedly were involved. Because if they had been acting outside the law, they could have been liable for billions of dollars of damages under the telecommunications regulatory statutes. So what Protect America did is it really instituted a new paradigm, whereas previously the National Security Agency had had to work very hard indeed to avoid even collecting the data of Americans anywhere in the world, this paradigm said you can pretty much scoop up what you like at the collection phase and then 
when you want to access it, then you worry about limiting your access to those people who are American. So it, it really meant the end of particular targeted warrants. And a special surveillance court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, FISC, which had been set up by the 1978 FISA Act, no longer, as it were, approved particular warrants under Protect America. They approved procedures for minimizing the impact on Americans at the access time. Clear so far? So then in 2008, just before Obama was elected, on a bipartisan basis, uh, we had the sort of the permanent arrangement that I want to talk about today, the 2008 FISA Amendment Act. Now, one complication in all of this American legislation is that when you have uh, an amending piece of legislation, a bill, it has a certain numbering, um, and then when it is folded in to the consolidated original legislation, it has a different numbering. So the particular law I want to talk about is alternatively known as 1881A, also known as Section 702. So it provides an authorization to access foreign intelligence information. It intentionally must target only non-US persons located outside the US. I say only, I mean that's the rest of the world. <laughs> It's a blanket authorization for one year, and it requires this minimization of accessing or inadvertent access on data about US persons after collection. It also says you've got to do a little bit of minimization before collection as well, uh, but probably on a fairly crude basis. And the, uh, the telecommunications or, or provider must provide all facilities and information to do this in secret. It's a contempt to the FISC court if they don't comply with this. And the providers, again, have complete immunity from civil lawsuits. And all of this must be done in a manner consistent with the Fourth Amendment.